Okay, well, we are recording, and I just wanted to, um, I need to get professionally upgraded so that we could compete with the Rare Center because they had music and they had all the sponsors. So um, I definitely wanted to do this because these are the people that kind of keep UCIF going. And um, we really appreciate this and really makes all of our programs, um, you know, possible. So, um, okay, Marianne, if you can come back to the crew, we are recording. Um, officially welcome. Um, I'm really going to let Sarah start off, or I should say Dr. Litvin. Um, she's our partner in crime, and we've done some joint efforts together. Um, and I think it started out almost with the, with the movie that we did in September, and it's going to be two years quickly uh, that we did that. And last week, we were part of the Roland uh, Rare Revival as we rolled the rolls down Broadway. But Sarah, you want to give a little welcome and a little uh, recap of where we're at? I would love to, and I'm just so happy to be here. This is this is so fun. Um, I love working with you guys. Um, my name is Sarah Litvin. I am the director of the Rear Center for Immigrant Culture and History. Um, and I wanted to welcome you because this event is so exciting because it's not just the UCIF meeting. It's also the fourth of our Zoom program in the series that we're calling The World Needs Bread. Um, we've had kitchen classes and learned about culture and history of bread traditions from around the world. So a little recap on what we've been doing. We started in January with Who Remembers Rears Hala, which was part of the Day of Jewish Learning in collaboration with the Ulster County Jewish Federation. And then in February, we partnered with Think Chinatown to learn about Fa Go, which is this Lunar New Year um, tradition. And then, as Les said, last week, we got back to the heart of the building in the screen behind me, Rear's Bakery, and um, had eight different bakery sponsors give bread that we all tasted and tried to figure out how might we reverse engineer the recipe for the rolls that the Rear's used to sell from this building for 80 years. But of course, the recipe doesn't, doesn't remain anymore. Um, and then today, here we are with Celia Flor Cruz, and we're looking at Italian Easter bread. So this is really so fun. This is the last one of this series for this season, but it's something we intend to do again next year. And I really needed to make sure to thank um, Dr. Willa Zen, who is our sort of my partner in crime at the Culinary Institute, where she teaches in the Applied Food Studies program, which is how we got to Celia. Um, so Les is going to introduce Celia in, in a minute, but um, I did just want to take a minute to to say a couple of more words on a kind of a more serious note before before we get going, um, which is to acknowledge the tragedy that happened earlier this week in Georgia, where six women of Asian descent were murdered, um, an event that has brought to light for so many of us the legacy and the ongoing problems of anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander hate in our society. And it's something that's so seldom discussed. But I really think that hatred at its heart comes from a fear of difference. And if that's true, then the key to combating hate, or a key anyway, to combating hate and prejudice is learning about and sharing our cultures and getting to know people from different backgrounds. So I think that as we're sort of reflecting and learning and mourning, I also want to acknowledge how important it is to show up to events like this, whether it's to learn about your own tradition or to share it in partnering with the Rear Center so that we from different backgrounds can learn about each other, become friends with each other as we have done through the work that we've done over the last two years, as Les said. Um, and you know, the, the word that we use in my Jewish tradition for this is tikkun olam, or repairing the world. That's what it is to share and teach each other's culture. So on behalf of, of the Rear Center board and myself, we are just so grateful. Thank you, Sarah. Um... Um, on behalf of UCIF, welcome and, and upcoming um, some more partners in crime activities in June um, will are going to be part of the multicultural celebration. And this year, Sarah and uh, the Rare Center is going to be doing their festival down on the Strand at the uh, Sunday Farmers Market, June 13th, 20th, and 27th. 
And then we're hoping to put together another program in September at the Rear Center uh, with some readings. And uh, I need to give Sarah another week to pull that together. And then <laughs> finally, if everything keeps going in the direction that it's going, we'll be doing the multicultural dinner um, in November. So we're looking forward to that and working with the Rear Center again. And, um, and we enjoy that. And I think what, what Sarah said is so appropriate about sharing our traditions, uh, sharing our, our heritage. And I was reading this morning in 1939 and 1940, Italians weren't, learned, weren't allowed on public transportation and buses uh, in much of the country. So uh, when we think about that, um, uh, it does say something about, you know, what did exist and, you know, what we're going through now. But um, on behalf of everybody with the Ulster County Italian American Foundation, we we really want to foster, um, you know, building relationships and, and sharing our heritage. Um, speaking of that, I need to make a couple quick announcements for those of you who didn't listen to Tuto and, and Linda's here and Linda and, and several of our board members. But <clears throat> yesterday I, I shared some good news. Um, we are planning to come out of captivity in June <clears throat> and have our scholarship and community grants award dinner. And we're gonna do it outdoors at the Hits Pavilion up in Saugerties. And the pavilion seats over 500 people. So we'll be able to, to meet outdoors and have a dinner. Um, and it's gonna to be towards the end of June. And then Linda and Gina, the, the two cohorts in crime are in the midst of finalizing the schedule of our summer movie series at Reginato's. And um, that will start in the end of May and go all summer long. And we're excited about that. Devin and Stephanie are doing some renovations out there and the crew has picked the movies, basically carried over from the canceled schedule last year. So that's that's really, really important. And then Anna Brett and her crew, we're planning on our October festival. And um, so much as that is going to be dependent on the rules and regulations for a gathering, uh, but we'll see where we are in October. So there's a lot going on. Um, Deb and Anthony will be handling another cleanup crew on Saturday, April 24th. Um, and that's another great initiative. So although there's a pandemic, we're not slowing down at UCIF. And I'm really excited that we're able to run this program today. Um, I don't know where to start about Celia. I feel like she's family already. Uh, we started on a Zoom and worked our way about her bringing me samples of her Easter bread. And all week she's been perfecting. I think she's made enough Easter bread to feed everybody that's on here and probably um, half of our UCIF membership. But, um, and the more I read about Celia and the more I talk to her and her husband, Ken, I'm just really impressed. They joined UCIF and, um, and made a contribution but these two people are really special. Both of them are graduates of West Point um, a while ago, and um, both of them are retired. And upon retirement, they spent a year in Italy. So um, talk about going back to the roots. It's interesting because in the past, we used to have 40 women, right, Linda? Um, out of Reginato's with the aprons, and Nancy and I were probably along with Kevin Reginato were the only males there. And I didn't stay too long. I don't look good in an apron. But um, this year, because of the virtual element, we really uh, wanted to do something special. And through Sarah and through the culinary, um, we met Celia. And Celia has been working all week and we've been going back and forth on the recipe and come up with different recipes. And Ken has been tasting, and um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know I'm envious of him. But I don't want to steal too much of her thunder. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Celia. But before I do, on behalf of everyone here and the foundation and the Rare Center, we want to thank Celia 
and her husband, Ken, really for making this possible. Um, and when you talk about bring, bringing in the experts, we have the experts. So Celia, welcome and uh, we're turning it over to you. Thank you, Les. I don't know about expert, but I have studied it a lot. <laughs> so as Sarah mentioned, uh, the reason that we're linked together here is because of Dr. Will Azen, who's one of my professors at the culinary. And I did a research paper for her in my first semester. The, um, it was a really disorienting experience to start school at the age of 60 with a bunch of 18 year olds but that's what it was. And it was also under COVID. So to be able to do a research paper when there were no libraries was pretty daunting. And um, there were a lot of times during that first semester where I told Dr. Zen, I just thought I was gonna quit because I wasn't getting enough out of it and I wasn't understanding what was happening to our world and uh, everything else happening around us. But I'm glad that I stuck, I stuck that part out at least because it gave me a chance to synthesize a lot of things, learning about my mother-in-law and her family. And we had researched them in Italy when we were there in the times before COVID and learned so much about where Kenny comes from and, and how Teresa Zioli came to be. And it was very enriching. And so the, the paper was to be in conjunction with Sarah's efforts at the Rarer Center. We, we each had to research an ethnic bread and so I chose Easter bread, which was harder than I would have thought. But it was hard because even though everyone seems to have an Easter bread in all the different provinces and regions of Italy, they're not all the same. The only thing that you could say about the many different types of Easter bread is that they all celebrate the same thing, which is the end of a Lenten fast. And back, when, back before the great diaspora where millions of Italians fled a starving continent, which is where most of your forefathers came from, Lent meant that you didn't have any animal products at all for 40 days and 40 nights. And that included eggs. So Easter dinner was lamb and ham and breads and cheese and milk and dairy and everything that people hadn't enjoyed. And because people had their own chickens back then, there was a lot of surplus eggs to be used. So um, before I go any further, I do need to have a disclaimer here. I am not officially representing the Culinary Institute of America. I'm not even a baking student. I'm a culinary student. But I would like to share what I have learned about Easter bread and my husband's uh, heritage. So um, <clears throat> Easter bread has a lot of eggs in it, as I was just saying. But the other thing that Italian-American Easter bread celebrated was A, access to really nice white flour. Because back in, in starving Italy, when Mussolini was advocating bread is something you don't need a lot of, he was trying to tell them that because they were starving, white flour was reserved for the, only the very wealthy. And your average Italian didn't have access to fine white flour. And we can get gobs of it in our grocery stores and farmer's markets. Um, and another thing they didn't have access to was white sugar. So there's a lot of sweet Easter breads. Somebody in this group here was mentioning before we all got busy here was that there was a pizza rustica that was a tradition in his family. That is another traditional Easter bread. There are many. So... I made my mother-in-law's recipe and it was as I remembered it, which was dry and heavy. <laughs> and it was dry and heavy, I learned as I experimented all week long because they used a lot of eggs. They were trying to use those eggs to celebrate this end of Lent. They also didn't have bread flour, which, has, which would support growing a, a gluten structure within the bread and help it to rise. So I've adapted it so that it's a little easier but if your recipe is different, it's different for great reasons. Italy was separated by mountains and oceans and rivers and a lot of reasons why people didn't necessarily have things in common. But for some reason, those Italians managed to still have something in common across all of those barriers. So I'm going to get started here and, and give you an idea of, of how this bread comes together. And if you have questions as we go along, I sure hope you'll <coughs> let me know. 
So in this modified recipe, you start with a, a couple of cups of bread and then the yeast. This is one package of yeast. This is a traditional sponge. And I haven't changed the sponge, even though I've changed the um, quantity. I cheat a little. I use the microwave, which, you know, a good cook doesn't do, but Celia does. Um, I melt the, the butter inside the milk. And, and the, it's the warmth of the milk and the butter that's going to get that yeast to come alive. Typically, you would do this on the stove top, but you want to make sure you're getting the right temperature. So I use an instant probe, although in this household, we have a lot of, we have a lot of thermometers in this household. So if you've got a thermometer that looks like this, a thermometer that looks like this, a thermometer that looks like this, any of them would work. Anybody got any questions so far? How many cups of flour did you use? Just now I put in two. Two. So Kenny's grandmother came over to the United States when she was just a few months old. And um, her parents had been married in January of that, that year. She was born in October. But her father had come to Poughkeepsie just a few months after she was conceived. So their reunion uh, required an awful lot, like many of your ancestors probably did. Kenny's great-grandmother came over here with $12 and a baby. She didn't speak English. Can you imagine how daunting that would be? You probably can if you've got grandmothers and grandfathers that came from Italy. My point in that is that uh, they survived something pretty significant, and there was a certain amount of trauma involved in that. So the fact that we have recipes that maybe I don't think are very tender by modern standards um, doesn't, doesn't respect everything that they've been through in order to come to this country. So I just heated this up too much, so i got to stir it a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to kill the yeast. If, if it's any greater than 120 degrees, you might kill the yeast, and then you completely defeat your process. Anyway, so um, her father came over here at a time when, or um, Kenny's grandmother's father, uh, came over here at a time when your average Italian didn't have the benefit of schooling. That was only for people who had enough money. So he couldn't write his own name. In most of the documents I found, he, he did it with an X. So he misspelled his own last name. And I didn't learn that until we went to Italy. And... Um, his, I had to tell Kenny's godmother she'd been misspelling her own name for 72 years. <laughs> Excuse me, are you, are you going to give us the uh, amounts? Oh, I thought you already had them. No. I'm sorry. Yes. So I just put in two cups of flour with one package of yeast. And then I, I heated up one cup of milk. And then I added to that one cup of milk, a quarter cup of sugar. One thing that was missing in my mother-in-law's original recipe was one teaspoon of salt. When I was trying to figure out how to make the recipe a little lighter, um, I went through 20 recipes, 20 historic Easter bread recipes. And I compared the different um, proportions of the flour and the yeast and the sugar and the salt and um, they were similar but they didn't all do the same thing in the end so yeah this sponge is two cups of flour one package of yeast one cup of milk a quarter cup of sugar Or a cup of butter and a teaspoon of salt. Thank you for asking that question. You see, I missed the butter. Uh, how much butter? One quarter cup. You One missed it because I didn't say it very well. I apologize. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm sorry. Celia, is it is it the same recipe that um, you published in your paper? Should I put that in the chat or would that confuse things? It is not the same recipe. And, and um, I would 
love for you to provide that to people since I went through all this work all week to try to find something that made it easier. Okay. All right, so I have here the heated milk, sugar, and salt, and butter. Milk, sugar, salt, and butter, yeah. And I'm gonna add it to the flour and the yeast that are in the mixing bowl. Is that a quick, quick rise yeast, Celia? Um, I did not this time, I used regular yeast. And that's another thing, thank you, Joanne, for asking that question. When, when Teresa, my mother-in-law, your great aunt or whatever she is to you, um, she used to use compressed yeast because that's pretty much what they had. And compressed yeast didn't have the same success rate as the yeast that we can buy in the grocery store today. So um, one of the recipes that I tried to use, one of the recipes that I, that I uh, experimented with, with was Lydia Bastianich's recipe. You may be familiar with a lot of her cookbooks. Hers was also a historic recipe, and she called for four packages of yeast. It was probably that, the fact that she, it, the recipe came from a time when you didn't have access to the kind of yeast that we use today. I'll show you what I'm using. Same thing you can probably get a hold of where you are. It's just your typical active dry yeast. It's a lot more stable. It's a lot more reliable. But I'll have to tell you, Lydia's recipe was a pain in the butt. 